Greetings and good morning to all worshippers in the sanctuary and in the church hall and all those worshipping with us on YouTube and in Facebook. Today, my message, the Sermon on the Plain, is a continuation of our journey through the Gospel according to Luke. There are two parts of, to this message, which is about blessings and the wolves. Part two, God willing, will be delivered on next Lord's Day. This message is based on Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 26. In my last message from Luke chapter 6, we learn about the election of the 12 apostles by our Lord Jesus Christ. Before the 12 apostles were chosen from amongst his many disciples, our Lord Jesus did one thing first. He went to a mountain to pray to God. By this, he gave us a fine example as to what we as professed believers of our Lord Jesus must learn to do and emulate before undertaking any activity such as on waking up in the meeting, uh, waking up in the morning, before meals, before driving, walking, work, sports, meetings, decisions, and before going to bed and for church projects and activities. When the Lord Jesus prayed to God, he actually communed with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. In that mountain, the triune God made a decision on the selection of the 12 individuals and to become apostles. The Lord spent the whole night in prayer. The time he devoted in prayer revealed to us the importance of prayer in our daily lives. If, if we look and study Christ's earthly life and work, we will find that they were very much prayer dependent and prayer centered. Our life must therefore be a prayer centered and prayer dependent one. To many, prayer can be a burden. However, if we think about it, as someone once said, I quote, Prayer is a little bit like eating salted peanuts. The more you do it, the more you want to do it. Unquote. After the Lord had finished his all-night prayer, he came and called the disciples and he named them as apostles. These 12 chosen men were unknown to the Jewish religious establishment and people. They were poor, simple, and only had elementary education. As the morning progressed, and after the selection process was over, verse 17, And he came down with them, and stood in the plain, and the company of his disciples, and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him, and to be healed of their diseases. Amen. The huge crowd would naturally organize themselves into a semi-circular fashion, with the Lord in the center and the twelve close to him. These twelve men were aware of their newfound status as the inner circle of the Lord. This was the first time that they stood next to the Lord in an official and public capacity. Around them were other disciples who were on standby to provide whatever assistance as and when needed. Beyond this was a vast crowd of others who had come from far and near to see and to hear the Lord. There was excitement as well as tension in the air. This crowd of people was not disappointed because they witnessed miracles that were performed by the Lord. The sick were healed of their diseases. Further in verses 18 and 19, And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. 
and the whole multitude sought to touch him. For there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Amen. On this occasion, our Lord even permitted healing to those who sought to touch him, as he did at other times. The crowd was definitely amazed as to what had happened. But the miracles of exorcism and healing were nothing compared to what was to come. The great, that great thing that was coming was our Lord's preaching, which is known as the Sermon on the Plain. This sermon, recorded by Luke, was quite similar to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. Today, I would like to consider the following main points. Firstly, comparing Luke's and Matthew's sermons. Secondly, the blessing of poverty and the war of hell wealth in verses, verses 20 and 24. And thirdly, the blessing of hunger and the war of being full in verses 21a and 25a. Next week, I will deal with the following points, the blessing of sorrow and the war of laughter and the blessing of being hated and the war of being spoken well of. Let us begin with the first main point, comparing Luke's and Matthew's sermons. Luke's record of Christ's sermon look almost the same as that recorded by Matthew. Are Luke's and Matthew's sermons the same? There are many Bible commentators who would regard these two sermons as the same. However, there are also many who do not believe those two sermons to be the same. Let us consider the opinion of J.C. Ryle, an evangelical Anglican bishop who lived in the 19th century. I quote, This resemblance, in fact, is so striking that many have concluded that Luke and Matthew are reporting one and the same discourse. And that Luke is giving us, in a, an abridged form, what Matthew reports at length. There seems no sufficient ground for this conclusion. The occasions on which the two discourses were delivered were entirely different. Our Lord's re repetition of the same great lesson in almost the same words on two different occasions is nothing extraordinary. It is unreasonable to suppose that, that none of his mighty teachings were ever delivered more than once." Unquote. Next, let us consider the opinion of R. Ken Hughes, a senior pastor emeritus of College Church in Wheaton. Quoting, There are substantial differences between the sermon we find in Luke's and Matthew's sermons. A. Matthew devotes three long chapters to Jesus' sermon, Luke only one. B. Matthew records nine Beatitudes, Luke 4. C. Luke's Beatitudes do not focus on the positives as do some of Matthew's. Blessed are the pure in heart, and so on. D. The sermon in Luke only includes the negatives, such as poverty and hunger. E. Also, the wars that follow Luke's Beatitudes have no parallel in Matthew's sermon. In fact, in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, the wars were omitted. F. And Luke's Beatitudes are given in the more personal second person, ye, which is plural, you, rather than in Matthew's third person, they. G. Lastly, the language that Luke records is much more stark and physical than Matthew's account. For example, Matthew says, Bless are the poor in spirit, while Luke simply says, blessed be ye poor. So I conclude that Luke presents a separate sermon with a distinct theological intention, unquote. What about the location of the two sermons? The sermon recorded by Luke 
was delivered in the plain after the twelve apostles had been ordained, whereas the sermon recorded by Matthew was delivered on a mountain, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, before the twelve apostles were chosen. Finally, we cannot expect our Lord to preach a message once and was never repeated. He could be preaching the same or almost the same message in different locations to different audiences at different times and under different circumstances. Many pastors and preachers have preached the same message to different congregations even on the same day. Now that we have sorted out a few facts about Luke's and Matthew's sermons, we will consider first, secondly, the blessing of poverty and the war of health, wealth. Before going any further, let us define the meanings of blessed and woe. Blessed as an adjective means, quoting from West, West Webster Dictionary 1828.com, happy, prosperous in worldly affairs, enjoying spiritual happiness and the favor of God, enjoying heavenly felicity, unquote. The word blessed has also been defined as an overwhelming, quoting again, pleasant, joy-filled contentment and an inner state of spiritual well-being, unquote. What about war? According to the Dictionary of Bible Themes, the uses of the word war in the Bible have been characterized as follows, quoting, War as an exclamation of judgment on others. War as an exclamation of misfortune on oneself. War as an exclamation of sadness over others. And war may give way to forgiveness, comfort, and deliverance, unquote, from Mensa. Next, let us go into the Lord's message. The Lord began his preaching. Luke chapter 6, verse 20a reads, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples. Our Lord Jesus lifted up his eyes by focusing on his disciples near him. He directed his sermon specifically to his personal followers, which would include the chosen twelve and his other disciples. It was not directed at the gen general crowd, but whatever the Lord would say was within their hearing range and they were welcome to listen. Then the Lord started his sermon with a statement that poverty was a blessing in verse 20b. And he said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. When the Lord said, Blessed be ye poor, we must be careful that we do not misunderstand our Lord's meaning. It does not mean that every person who is poor is entitled to the Lord's blessing. Then he added soon after another statement in verse 24. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Amen. Again, we must not misinterpret the Lord's meaning here. It does not mean that a disaster or an affliction will come on anyone who is rich. To have an understanding of these two, two authoritative statements, we need to go back to the Old Testament because that is where our Lord's stated principle originated. In the Old Testament, poverty per se was not necess necessarily seen as a blessing. In Proverbs, chapter, Proverbs 30, verses 8b to 9, Agar reveals that poverty can be a blessing or a misery. Verse 8b. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? 
or lest I be poor and still and take the name of my God in vain. Amen. Aga prayed not to be poor in case he was forced to steal and take the name of his God in vain. He also prayed that he be not rich in case he would be full and deny God. Both extremes may lead to frightful temptations. To be very poor is a miserable condition. Anyone who has been in real poverty will confirm that it is a demeaning experience. To them, poverty is not a blessing. If we were to consider wealth as power and status, then the poor would be powerless at the mercy of the rich and powerful and have no hope. They are predisposed to isolation from society and exploitation. In the Old Testament period, there were poor Israelites who were actually blessed. This was especially so when the kingdom of Judah fell and God's people were taken into exile in Babylon. These exiles were dispossessed of their dignity, status, and wealth. They lost everything and became very poor. As they settled down in their new foreign land, not all remained in poverty. Some, by compromising their religious beliefs and culture, by their resourcefulness and adopting the new paganistic Babylonian way of life and culture, they became rich. Later, later these rich exiles did not want to return to their homeland to rebuild the fallen walls of Jerusalem. Instead, it was the poor who did not compromise. They were the ones who returned to the land God had given them. This leads us now to our Lord's quote of Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 2, at the beginning of his ministry in the synagogue in Nazareth. Luke chapter 4, verse 18a reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The poor in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, referred to those uncompromised Israelite exiles who were aware that they were helpless and were not able to deliver themselves. So they looked and longed for the coming Messiah and his salvation. For the next several hundred years, Israel was occupied by foreign empires, Persians, Greeks, and by the time of our Lord Jesus' ministry, the Romans. The poor were still in existence. They were really poor. They were the ones who yearned for the fulfillment of Israel's promise. In the New Testament, Luke gave two fine examples of the poor, Simeon and Anna. Luke chapter 2 verse 25 reads, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Amen. Simeon was waiting for the consolation or comfort of Israel. And in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 and 37, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asa. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. Amen. Anna spent much of her time in the temple fasting and praying. These two individuals were certainly poor and yet not concerned about, nor were they attached to the riches, riches and possessions of this world. 
They were only longing for the kingdom of God. They were waiting for the Messiah. When our Lord Jesus finally came, He established His kingdom and He gave the good news to the poor. He even lived by example, by becoming poor Himself. One man said to Him that He would follow Him wherever He went in Luke chapter 9, verse 57. The Lord answered Him in the next verse, 58. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Amen. The Apostle Paul even attested of the Lord's poverty in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Amen. The Lord's disciples were mostly poor. His disciples believed that he was the only hope of the world and the only way to eternal life. They had no love for wealth and things of this world. In fact, they had given everything away, committed, committed themselves to the Lord and had forsaken their riches. When the Lord said, Blessed ye be poor. Did he mean the poor with respect to money or wealth? The Greek word used here for poor is not restricted to the lack of wealth, but includes lack of influence, honor, and power that is lacking in anything in society. It can also mean being humble of wealth or being humble in spirit. I believe the Lord also included the letter. The Lord looked at his disciples and said these comforting and approving words, Blessed be, blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Do these spiritually and physically poor disciples who seek after God, the kingdom of God belonged to them. Salvation is given to them. That means the kingdom of God is theirs. As the kingdom of God belongs to the Lord Jesus, they are now joint heirs of the kingdom with him. Therefore, we who believed by faith on our Lord Jesus and are humble before him, the kingdom of God is ours. We are joint heirs of his kingdom with our Lord Jesus Christ. Even though we are here on earth, we belong to him and his kingdom. However, however, the Lord said in verse 24, But woe unto you that are rich, for ye, ye have received your consolation. Are the rich going to suffer for being rich? These words must have hit like a thunderbolt, especially to the disciples who were well off. The rich in the crowd who heard this must be puzzled and concerned about this statement. In Israelite society or history, there were very rich individuals. Amongst them were Abraham and King Solomon. There were even times when God blessed Israel with wealth. When the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt, in Exodus chapter 12, verses 35b and 36, they, that is the Israelites, borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required. And they spoiled the Egyptians. Amen. The Israelites borrowed, meaning ask, the Egyptians for silver and gold and clothing. The Egyptians gave this readily so that the Israelites could live as quickly as possible. The ordinary Egyptians had been through much suffering from the 10 
from the ten plagues, that they were probably glad to see them go. The Lord blessed the departing Israelites with wealth that the, Lord, that the Egyptians lent, that is, gave or granted at their request. After 40 years wandering in the Sinai, Sinai wilderness, God brought these Israelites to the promised land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a land of plenty and richness. During the reigns of King David and Solomon, national wealth was seen as a blessing, was seen as a blessing by God in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 13 to 16. God blessed Solomon with incredible riches in 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 14 to 18. Wealth is therefore not necessarily a bad thing. The rich do not necessarily suffer or afflicted by being rich. But, mark the Lord's statement in Luke chapter 6, verse 24 again, But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. The Lord here directed this statement to those who were rich in the world's goods and, and who had no relationship with God. In particular, the Pharisees or the persons of high social status amongst the crowd. These seek and love their riches and wealth. And because of that, they become proud and arrogant and were detached from God. They found comfort or consolation in them. They were satisfied with their lot and they did not need God. God was not their priority. They did not need the gospel. To them, they had received their consolation, but they forgot that life was short and God would call them up on an appointed, and on an appointed time decreed by him. In Luke chapter 12, verse 20, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? They will soon find too late how poor and worthless was such consolation when compared to that provided by the gospel. All the gold, silver, money, properties and other riches would not bring them to heaven. Only the gospel of life would. How about us? The well-off or rich are prone to be tempted to rely solely on riches for their consolation rather than on God. There is the risk of becoming, of becoming insensitive to their own need and the need of others by their abundance. The rich have a tendency to be proud with egoistic arrogance by their success and achievements and to withdraw from God, His church and His people. The rich also had their tendency to believe that their opinions are better value than others. Their priority is to climb as high as possible the professional or social ladder. Are the rich amongst us behave in this way? What must the wealthy believers do? They must not trust or rely on their riches and yet still be rich. They can have plenty and yet must be aware or have a feel of their need and the need of others. They must live a life of simplicity and humility and not to waste their substance on unnecessary things. And of course, they must be willing to depend on God to serve Him and His church and His people. If our rich decline all this, then I have to remind them what the Lord said. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Why be covetous of riches when we cannot take them with us when God calls us home to Him? Take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19. Every man also to whom God had given riches and wealth had given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. 
This is the gift of God. Our riches, our wealth, it is the gift of God. God has blessed us with riches and he expects us to use them for his glory. Use them for the Great Commission. Do not rely on riches for our consolation. Be poor even when we are rich. Remember the Lord's words, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. What the Lord has said must be a shock to his disciples and the crowd. There was more to come. Next, he said, the blessing of hunger and the world of being full. In Luke chapter 6, verse 21a, the Lord said, Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Moments later, he said in verse 25a, Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. The disciples must be wondering why the Lord said it was a blessing to be hungry, and then a warning was given to them who were full. It sounded so contradictory. There's no direct reference to connect blessing with physical hunger in the Old Testament. However, it does mention of a different type of hunger. Let us consider two passages from the Psalms of David. Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. Let us read that together. As the heart panted after the water brooks, so panted my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsted for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now let's turn to Psalm 63, verse 1, and read that together too. Psalm 63, verse 1. <clears throat> let's read. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsted for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Amen. In both of these passages, David used metaphorical language to describe his soul thirsting for God. He craved for God. He hungered for God. Without God, his life is dry or dull and meaningless. On the other hand, God had promised Israel in Jeremiah 29 verse 13, And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Amen. And that was what David did. He searched for God with all his heart. When the Lord Jesus comes, he will be the source of all satisfaction, not only for David, but for us as well. Our hunger and our thirst for God will be satisfied by our Lord Jesus. We will have our fill. Remember the encounter of the Lord with the Samaritan woman at the well? The Lord said to her in John chapter 4, verses 13 to 14, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. That water is the living water. Whoever drinks this water will never thirst. Also in John chapter 6, verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Amen. Our hunger shall be satisfied and our thirst shall be quenched when we believe on the Lord Jesus. What is this living water that the Lord spoke of? Let us consider the Lord's words spoken in the temple in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. Let us read that together. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. <clears throat> In the last day, that great day of the feast, 
Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. Our Lord Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the living water. This is the living water that the Lord Jesus gives to everyone who hungers for it, who thirsts for it, and believes in Him. By believing in Him, the believer has eternal life. The Lord Jesus is the only one who will satisfy our hunger and our thirst for God. Our Lord, quoting from our Ken Hughes, quoting, Jesus blesses spiritual hunger. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for ye shall be satisfied. The promise is at once eternal and temporal, because we can now we can know both hunger and satisfaction in this world. Unquote. Hence, if we hunger or thirst, that is long for God now. The Lord Jesus says, For ye shall be filled. We shall be filled with this living water. What happens when we are filled with this living water? Firstly, our salvation is secured because we are now, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Secondly, when we are filled with the living water, sin will be removed from our life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Thirdly, it will help us to know and understand the truth of God's words. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Fourthly, when our hunger or thirst is filled, we have a desire and love for God's word. Ezekiel 36 verse 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Fifthly, we become a better witness for the Lord when we have our fuel. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We have, therefore, the desire to share the gospel with others. Finally, when we are in hunger or thirst for God, He will satisfy us, satisfy us with a good relationship with Him and contentment in this world and in the next. We shall indeed be filled. Then the Lord warned in Luke chapter 6, verse 25a, Woe unto you that are full. For ye shall hunger. For those who are not hungry, for those who are satisfied with their present status in life, that is, their, with their wealth and prosperity, for those who feel they need nothing and do not need God, beware. They have their fill already. And the Lord said, Ye shall hunger. They will soon find out that their status in society, their wealth and prosperity will not satisfy them, and they will covet for more. They will never be satisfied. One day, all this will be taken away. Then they shall see their true desire, their own misery, and they shall hunger for something to satisfy their dying, sinful soul. They will soon realize that they need God 
to satisfy their needs. They will remember the Lord's words in John chapter 15, verse 5c. For without me, ye can do nothing. If they think these words are nothing, beware. Calamities may come on them very suddenly and quickly. The apostle wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Amen. If we confess that we believe in Christ Jesus, then seek not to be well fed with the things of this world. Rather, seek the things that are above in heaven. Quoting from Albert Barnes, Seek them as objects of pursuit and affection. Strive to secure them. Unquote. Instead of accumulating more and more wealth, shares, properties, savings, and to build a business empire, instead of seeking promotions, luxuries, experiences, and praises from men, seek to know more about God and His Son. Spend time in prayer to God. Commit to read the Bible daily. Fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, old or young, poor or well-off, poorly educated or highly educated, and to share the gospel with unbelievers, and only then we will have our field. The author of Hebrews asked believers in chapter 12, verse 2a, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And the Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, that our conversation, that is citizenship, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't mark the words, Mark the words of the Lord. Woe unto you, they are full, for ye shall hunger. While the disciples were digesting their, this unusual saying, trying to figure out what it all meant, the Lord then went on to the blessing of sorrow and the war of laughter, which I will continue next week. After selecting the twelve apostles, the Lord Jesus came down from came down with them from a mountain to a plain, where a big crowd had gathered. This crowd of people were, was not disappointed because many who were sick were healed of their diseases. Many who were vexed with unclean spirits were healed. Even those who touched him were also healed. After that, he preached to them a message known as the Sermon on the Plain. This sermon was quite similar to the Sermon on the Mountain which was recorded in Matthew's Gospel. There are differences between these two sermons. The Sermon on the Mount was delivered on a mountain before the twelve apostles were chosen, whereas the sermon recorded by Luke happened after the apostles were chosen. Matthew devotes three long chapters to Jesus' sermon, Luke only one. Matthew records nine Beatitudes, Luke only four. In Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, the woes were omitted. Then the Lord start, started his sermon with a statement that poverty was the blessing in verse 20b. And he said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Then he added soon after another statement in verse 24, But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. The next beatitude in Luke chapter 6 Verse 21a, the Lord said, Blessed are you that hunger now, ye, for ye shall be filled. Moments later, he said in verse 25a, Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. I will continue with the second part of this message, message next week. May God bless you all. Amen. Let us pray. We thank thee for this Lord's Day worship service and for the message that thou hast given us. Help us remember what we have heard and to put into practice in our lives and be good examples for and of thee uh, inside and outside our church. Let not the riches and wealth take us away from thee, but guide us that we would be willing to depend on thee to serve thee in thy church and thy people. 
Direct us to thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven, where we should all be looking to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.